This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us with me today is co-host Richard Fields and friend of the show, John Cameron. I'm host James Just, and we're here to talk about the politicizing of the coronavirus. It's been politicized in a number of ways. We've got um, women are all angry because at the president because of something or another. We have the Congress playing games with pandemic uh, response, whether they get unemployment or the stimulus check, they're arguing over details. So what do you guys think about all this, the politicization of, of this coronavirus? It's I, I'm going to be happy when the next president is uh, actually inaugurated because that's when the politicization will probably end. And there's a politicization on both sides. The Democrats are trying to keep the issue alive because they think it's the easiest way to uh, demonize uh, Trump with something that people are particularly concerned with right now. Uh, women in particular are concerned because they're uh, harder hit economically. And, and of course, that's not the, the virus that's hitting them economically. It's the, it's the lockdown. But the lockdown yeah. is making women who uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, are still primary caregivers, housekeepers, caregivers for their children, et cetera, putting them in a position where they really don't have time to continue their careers as well as uh, take care of their kids and keep the house. That's assuming they still have jobs. Uh, and, you know, uh, people are, are unhappy with the situation. They don't really understand why uh, the uh, you know, there's confusion about whether the virus is uh, as serious as it's made out to be, uh, but they're, they're really unhappy with the uh, state of uh, state of the situation as it is right now, and understandably. And I uh, absolutely agree with all that, and would add, I just read an article in, I think it was Foundation for Economic Education, and they, they had a little chart there about unemployment rates in red states versus blue states, basically because of the red states versus blue states response to um, to the uh, panic demic uh, or pandemic or whatever you want to call it, the control of virus. Um, and the, the uh, red states are doing sig significantly better financially. Um, their uh, unemployment is much lower than blue states because the blue states are you know, pretty much locking down everything and, and the red states aren't yet from the numbers that I can see, um, you know, the, the, the virus, virus deaths and virus cases and everything else pan out to be slightly better in the red states than the blue states. And again, you know, the blue states are typically, you know, higher population areas and, and all the rest of that. But they're also, uh, some of those states were, were, uh, the, the response by the governors was, was particularly egregious, uh, affecting, you know, the, the groups of people that we know are most uh, hard hit. You know, for example, uh, New York's uh, uh, wonderful idea of sending COVID patients back to care homes that probably resulted in about 10,000 deaths. So, and I think it's not, it, Richard made a very good point that it's not the, the, the epidemic or pandemic itself, it's a response to it. And, um, you know, we talked about politiza politicization, politicalization, I don't know, whatever the word is. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's the same thing with school districts, uh, you know, or, or kids back in school. It has nothing at all to do with the, the raw numbers of cases or anything else, because we all know none of the evidence points out that kids are at risk, um, as, as some eminent medical scholars have pointed out. Uh, more kids have died of the flu since this thing started than died of uh, coronavirus. And, you know, they don't catch it. And if you don't catch it, you can't spread it. And, you know, if they do catch it, they are affected by it. So the, the, the schools are shut down, uh, which, which has the effect of keeping, you know, women at home uh, to take care of kids and homeschool them and all the rest of that because no matter how equal people talk about you know, the uh, marriage being and the burden of chores and child rearing and everything weren't be, being more evenly split. We all know that's not the case. And it's all has to do with who's in power uh, in, in the, the uh, in the governor's chair in the state. 
So it's it's all political. And, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Well, when politicians pass laws, it becomes political by the very nature of politicians passing laws. It's you can't get away from it. it mm -hmm. It's going to become political when you have political solutions, and we've got a large number of heavy-handed political solutions or no political solutions, and so therefore it's become politicized. And the fact that we're surprised that way it's become so politicized is kind of, is the surprise in of itself. It's not that it's become politicized, it's that we're surprised by it. We have governors running their states by executive orders. We've got the president who is running the country by executive orders, and far too many of us seem to be okay with that. Not, For, not me. Can I just <laughs> go on record as saying not me? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, and and so we're getting a bunch of people upset. It's be, well, it's because for seven months now we've kind of destroyed whatever uh, governmental norms we've had. It's no yeah, longer just, just since the, this whole thing started, we've created more money, uh, twenty-two percent as much money as has been created by in the entire history of the country. It's uh, you know, which is going to lead to uh, hyperinflation or worse uh, in coming months. That's not uh, visible quite yet, but it will be sooner, you know, sooner rather than later. And it's it's shocking to me that the that all of the press I'm seeing, except for those that outliers like you know Cato maybe and 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 Reason and a couple others, are are saying that you know what needs to happen is a uh, you know a pandemic debt package. How about we just talk about in the pandemic so we don't have to do any of these other things so the 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 big banks and wall street and you know government agencies and governments all the rest of that have a vested interest in in um in keeping this thing going because the it gives them an excuse to print money and and buy more favors from their friends and uh you know, it's 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 hard to raise taxes to do that. Although they're, they're trying really hard in the state of California to to raise taxes every which way they can, um, so that they can you know hand money to their friends. But uh, you know, printing it is it's much easier. Print it and hand it to your buddies. And you know, as long as uh, you know they've got this, then you know what what was that quote you said? Uh, who who did that, Richard? Uh, uh, a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste or something like that. Yeah, Ronald Emanuel, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, so, so crisis is hard to waste. There, We have 24 hours left from, I guess, Pelosi or Trump. I forget which one of them gave a 48-hour notice yesterday to get this, to get the, their stimulus negotiations done. And, of course, why they won't just pass every the, the stuff that everybody kind of agrees on and then argue over the stuff. Other Come on, later. Nancy, make us more promises. Promise promise that. Make us more promises like that. We would love to see no more uh, bailout money passed because the solution to the problem is to end the lockdown, not to bail out the people who are hurt by the lockdown. Well, Absolutely. That's what I, I tried to say, only I used way more words than that. Really? Well, I think part yeah. of the problem we have is we've got lots of people unemployed, especially in California, who don't have jobs to go back to. And if you can True, end the lockdown. But you still have to end the lockdown in order for those jobs to come back. That's the only solution. Uh, back in uh, World War II, the uh, uh, spending uh, for the uh, federal government was cut by 75% between 1944 peak World War to spending in 1948, over four years, 75% reduction in spending. What happened? The economy boomed. We can do that again. We should. Uh, there, yeah, there will be dislocations, but that's uh, what that's the price you have to pay for decades of uh, profligacy. Hmm. So, what if if we had to, as as libertarians, if we had to, uh, if we had the ability to take out the red pen and just cross off? government agencies and government spending and all the rest of that. Uh, what, what would be number one? What would be number two? No, let's, put, let's do it a little bit differently. Let's say what would remain. The Department of War, which is what the Department of Defense was originally called, that would remain. We need to have uh, defense. But by defense, I mean defense, not offense in 150 countries around the world. That would remain. Uh, and uh, the you know Secretary of State to maintain uh, you know, Department of, uh, uh, of State to maintain uh, friendly relations uh, with other countries and uh, whatever else, the three or four cabinet departments that were in, in place at the beginning of the Republic. Those would remain, everything else would go. Hmm. So, so we'd be looking at federal spending of $100 billion, maybe? Well, yeah, I mean, you can do the math in a lot of different ways, but 75% cut would be real easy. 
Yeah. Yeah, you could probably save half that on just military spending alone. And speaking yeah, of military of, spending is actually only about thirty percent of the budget. Yeah, but yeah, uh, it's all you'd Medicaid. Probably, you probably want to re retain, you know, maybe a third of that. So that would that be twenty billion, twenty whatever, uh, twenty percent of the budget. But uh, I mean, you've got the, the 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 elephant in the room are the transfer programs: Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. That's uh, that along with uh, interest on the federal debt is two thirds of the budget, and a few other welfare programs. So yeah. those are the elephants in the room. And just take a look at Medicare and Medicaid, which everybody loves, particularly people of my age love because we think we're getting free medical care, but we're not. We're paying higher co-pays now than people without uh, Medicare pay in, in countries like Singapore, where the cost of medicine is about 25% of what it is here. Uh, the, the cost of medicine prior to Medicare was 5% of GDP. It's now 18% of GDP. That's because of the paperwork, paper pushing, and uh, inflationary uh, situation where you've got uh, a monopoly uh, buyer, a monopsony. That's well, there's, probably there's, right there's, there's there's another big thing going on in that. If you look at uh, wages in healthcare professions, and and I'm not even talking about the layers of of uh, the layers of bureaucracy and paper pushers and all the rest of that. Um, a ton of that expense is in inflated wages in the monopoly that you're talking about because there are a monopoly these uh, you know nurses unions and doctors unions and dentist unions and all the rest of that um, charge some exorbitant fees to have their their uh, what are they serfs they're highly paid serfs um, you know doing the care that we're getting and because you know people who are covered by this never see the you know they don't they don't see a balance sheet or income statement they just see that they can go to the doctors and they don't have to write a ten thousand dollar check they don't care you know you look at yeah you know, it's, it's real it's yeah the, the 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 problem to healthcare expense is real simple get the government out of it lock stock and barrel that's it's real easy not easy to that. implement but easy to formulate yeah get the transparency and honest pricing you can actually yep. deal with it. this whole notion of discount versus cash pricing is insane and and what people don't know is you can actually pay, get the discount rate if you pay cash just by asking for it but since nobody knows to ask for it they don't get it and so it's just so the whole system is kind of bizarre but speaking of bizarre systems there's confusion over prop 15 about who actually pays costs of uh, property taxes business pay and consumers well, pay all yeah, costs. yeah. Proper, that's the split property tax. That's is basically uh, a halfway repeal of Proposition uh, 13. thirteen, I believe. Uh, how the Jarvis mem the Jarvis proposition, which uh, froze uh, property taxes for both businesses and residences. Uh, what the uh, tax raisers are trying to do is to say, well, that, that's okay for for residences at least for now, but we need to go after these big corporations who never change hands because they're in the corporate structures, so they're their, their property taxes never go, or their property values never, there's never a transaction to establish a new property value. So we need to, you know, uh, make sure that businesses pay on assessed value and not transaction value. Uh, what it will do, obviously, is it will raise the amount of taxes that corporations pay. Do corporations pay taxes? Never has oh, ever uh -huh. a corporation paid a tax. The only people that pay taxes are people. And in the case of a corporate tax is paid by either the the customer, number one, and, and most of the time, the uh, shareholder or uh, the uh, employees. Those are the people that pay taxes whenever uh, taxes go up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, taxes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shareholders and reduced dividends, uh, employees and reduced wages, uh, consumers and higher prices. Those are the people that pay taxes. That's what will happen with a, a property tax increase with uh, for corporations. And what the what the people pitching these uh, increases in property taxes? I, I have one thing to do. Hold on, just a second. Um, I'll have to be quick for a change because I got to leave the show for one minute and come right back. Um, the um, what the, what they failed to say is that the the properties. Well, you said frozen, Richard. Taxes on them aren't actually frozen. Yeah, they go up two or three percent a year or whatever. Yeah. So what if? If uh, government spending, and that was close to what they assumed inflation to be, if government spending hadn't gone through the roof, 
then um, and they hadn't added you know so much uh, spending up and down the board, then they'd be fine. And if you sure. look at the amount of taxes being paid now on property versus when property prep, Prop 13 was put in, uh, the increase is huge. It's just not big enough to cover the uh, drunken drug craze spending of our governments. And I'll be right back. Yeah, it's, there seems to be a group of people who do not understand that the end consumer pays all costs. It's just a, on a business line, it's just a cost. Whatever the cost is, be it taxes or insurance or mortgage payment, it all comes out of the customer's pocket at the, at the end of the day. The customer has to pay these costs and they're trying to pretend that they're not. And it's, you know, we need this money for schools and all this stuff. Well, you know, maybe you shouldn't be so bloated and then you could actually have some money for schools. We're sitting here watching in Sacramento, uh, Unified School District. This has been a bloated, non-functioning school district since I was went to there as a kid. It was bloated when I was a kid going to the school. It was bloated when my kids went through it. And it's a bloated, non-functional school district now. And yet we're supposed to continually pay more and more taxes to cover that cost. And it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there's a reason why private schools, whether even the most Tony private schools, the tuition is less than what we spend on public school uh, costs, all things, all all sources of cost considered when you consider the fact that you've got uh, federal money through the DOE, Department of Education coming in, you've got state money coming in, as well as local property tax uh, funding for schools. They, the public schools end up spending more money than, than certainly all Catholic schools uh, or uh, religious schools and uh, more than most uh, private uh, high-end uh, private education. Mm. Yeah, and if you look at the administrative costs in the in the California State University system, I don't know what it is for the University of California system because we have two different systems of quote unquote public education uh, or government education. Administrative costs have been rising at eighteen percent a year. Eighteen percent a year. Yeah, and and again, it's because free money in the form of uh, student loans, which people who are 18 think, you know, I guess they kind of figure they'll never have to repay it or something. I'm not sure, but you know, you, it's easy to borrow money uh, when you're, you know, having fun going to parties, uh, having, having a great time in college and uh, getting a degree that is not going to be worth uh, as much as you think it is. Uh, but all that, all of that, all of that demand, that loan inspired demand has allowed colleges to raise prices indiscriminately. Mm -hmm. And they'll continue to do so as long as they're not kept in check. And the the, you know the the pitch is always that that's what I, I hate about politics. Uh, you know, in in commerce, when you when you make a sales pitch to somebody, you're pitching uh, either you know features or benefits, and hopefully you're preaching preaching benefits. But there is actually a correlation between what you're selling and what you provide. Whereas in the public sector. You know, these sales pitches for, for raising taxes to support schools, um, they're pitching that they are going to spend it on edu educating the kids and without it, the roof's going to leak and all the rest of that. But what you're buying is uh, a whole bunch of, of bureaucrats who retire with bloated pensions and a very poor quality product of future workers. So, um, you know, again, it, it, I think the first thing that I, I would do if I had the magic uh, monarch of the universe wand and could wave it would be get rid of uh, forced education, you know, the so-called public education, which is government education. And all they teach is government. They teach uh, in history classes. Uh, they don't teach about uh, the advances that, that people have created uh, through hard work and ingenuity or very little, maybe 5% of the curriculum. The rest is all about government caused wars and government caused massacres and which dictator was in place during a certain period of time. I'm done with that. That kind of stuff should not be what's, what's important to people. What they need to learn about or what people are capable of doing and have accomplished great music, great art, great inventions, which is done by individual people, not by governments. Governments make problems. They don't fix them. And, and an understanding of how economies work. Uh, economics is uh, at best a uh, uh, an elective in most public schools. Yeah. And I, th I don't, uh, you know, I, and, and I, the way they teach economics is, is, uh, you know, pseudo economics anyway, it's Keynesian yeah. uh, nonsense. Keynesian nonsense. And, uh, 
yeah, I, and I think it's it's culminated in in the knowledge which which would have made me cry, but I've kind of already cried out about what's going on. That uh, New York Times uh, did a two thousand word article on on Venezuela and and didn't mention the word socialism once. So uh, you know, may may you live in interesting times. Yeah. Well, as we're speaking of the New York Times, the New York Times read an article the earlier this week or last week, I guess it is. As, as local newspapers dies, there's a pay-to-play network of news is rising in its wake, they claim, and they're complaining. But it's actually a complaint that this new wave of newspapers, of news delivery channels, is now replacing them, and they're all upset about it. Oh, it's how terrible it is. Well, the news business has always been pay-to-play. I mean, it's always been paid for by advertisers. Do you think advertisers have influence on what uh, the uh, newspaper or the radio station or the TV station uh, considers to be news, what gets spiked, what doesn't? Of course, it has an influence. It's always been pay-to-play. What's happening now has become more partisan in that the, uh, the payers are now not necessarily businesses paying uh, for advertising. It's uh, Republican and Democratic, I'm sure, operatives uh, buying uh, the uh, paying to, to get stories placed, uh, and, and, some, and, and in some cases, the stories are questionable as to the credibility. Mm -hmm. And it's done through uh, a, a number of uh, uh, broadsheets or, or you know, news outlets or, or web outlets that uh, uh, are replacing what used to be your weekly uh, or daily uh, local newspaper. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it used. You talk about pay, pay per play in the in the newspaper industry. I remember an, an actual incident where I visited a newspaper in uh, um, Belleville, Illinois, and they had published. Uh, they, they had a a very good article about p police brutality and and uh, I think some corruption, and advertisers uh, pulled left and right. Um, they, they didn't like it because they were, and this is a, an area border between a predominantly uh, upper middle class or you know, white area and a predominantly lower um, class, predominantly black area. And, and their advertising revenue dropped by, I don't know, 20% almost instantly. People said, you, we don't want you printing stories like that. We don't want you... Um, uh, you know, our, we love our police and they need to keep those sons of blah, 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 on the other side of this law. Anyway, and, and, and the newspaper publisher said, uh, too bad, you know, we're going to publish the news. And, you know, if you want to take your advertising dollar somewhere else, take them. But that was in the glory days of the newspaper where, you know, you couldn't take your money to the Internet. And, uh, you know, radio was, was strong and all the rest of that. But you basically had to have an ad in the local newspaper if you wanted the doors of your business to stay open. Richard and I remember that, that, that those days where, you know, shoppers took a little bit of bite out of that, but newspapers were money machines. Like the Sacramento Bee that's bankrupt was in 2006, its share price was $700 a share. So anyway, crazy well, times, but I think newspapers had by the very, uh, the, the power that they had, uh, a little more ability to stay objective in the market. And they weren't, uh, I don't remember them being as blatantly one-sided and as massively pro one political. Yeah, party. well, I mean, newspapers have historically always leaned on their editorial uh, endorsements uh, page, at least, to favor Democrats. That's That's been true historically. It's probably more so now All than right. it has been. Uh, but you also have to take a look at who was doing the influencing. Back then, it was businesses. Now it's politicians or political yeah. operatives. That's yeah. the difference. And that's a little bit scary, actually, because uh, it makes the uh, degree of pressure uh, first-degree pressure rather than second- or third-degree pressure. It's uh, uh, politicians trying to save their bacon rather than uh, businesses trying to save their bacon, which can be bad, but not as uh, dire. Uh, that businesses don't have the same kind of control over the citizenry that uh, government does. And yeah, it's, it's very, 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 yeah, very well, there's rare. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of money floating around in political advertising. And so it's, so it's not just, you know, politicians. They spend a lot of money on commercials and advertising on, if not even on the newspaper, but right on the newspaper's websites. 
And my yeah. biggest problem with the newspaper is I don't learn anything from it. And you can sit there and you read the newspaper every day and I don't learn anything new from the second. Well, and, and, the, and the other part of this whole uh, thing is that government has the ability to control whether or not any news outlet survives or uh, is or dies simply through changing regulations. That's why we're seeing Twitter uh, bow to democratic pressures to uh, stifle and spike uh, conservative news stories. That's why we uh, see uh, Facebook uh, knuckling under pressure. That's why, uh, you know, part of that, of course, is the editorial opinion on those at those outlets uh, from the get go. But a lot of it is just knuckling under pressure. And uh, government pressure is a hell of a lot more uh, dire. They can put you out of business by edict, whereas uh, business, uh, businesses can put, or advertisers can put uh, uh, publishers out of business only through uh, lack of revenue. That takes a lot longer, and there's always other sources of revenue. Yeah, yeah there's and always other customers, right? If you you're a see, business, uh, there's always other customers. You don't see Apple. Yeah, a be better, quicker analogy is probably you don't see uh, Target, uh, Target, putting together armed patrols to go take business from Walmart, and uh, you know basically that's the difference between a business relationship and a government relationship. All business relationships, unless they are government established monopolies, and we have way too many of them now because government is 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 in everything, are voluntary. You you can you you can vote with your feet. Unfortunately, when government passes regulation or law, you, you know, risk risk going to jail uh, or fined or both for simply not doing what they want you to do. So it's it's a much tougher world. Yeah, it's even hard to uh, escape a taxation by voting with your feet. California mm -hmm. is now trying to uh, uh, send the tax man after people that uh, leave the state uh, for mm -hmm. a number of years. Yeah, for like 10 years or something, it, they wanted to pass a tax where they can get you your income for like 10 years after you've left or something. It's I, all I'm, yeah, I find very even, bizarre. In, even in even this environment, I'm, I would be really, really hard pressed to see that uh, standing a constitutional muster. Uh, all right, well, that is about all the time we've got, though. And I want to tell you that the reason there's I can give you a quick example of why people mistrust the media. The very first question I was asked when I sat down for the editorial board with the Sacramento Bee was, aren't you really a Republican? That was the very first question <laughs> I was asked by the editorial of Sacramento the editorial board. And you want it? Yeah. So that's what was your happened. answer? Did what you just laugh out, laugh out loud? No, I just gave him the straight answer. I've been a libertarian since the late 90s. Was, there was no reason getting all upset about that. That's all the time we've got. You can visit us at libertariancounterpoint.com and you can find us on all the various social media outlets. Thank you for your time and please remember to love everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for The Libertarian Counterpoint.